Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yahad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able and On Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently evil. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. Arlene is not here today due, uh, due to recuperating um, in the hospital, but we wish her well. Uh, we would like to welcome our guest all the way from Israel, Dr. Alan Wecker from Haifa University, Israel, who, ha who is a PhD in computer information systems. Um, his work extends uh, from patents at uh, IBM a long time ago uh, in the early 80s to working at Haifa University. Now we, uh, we uh, want to um, thank uh, Mr. Wecker for joining us today on Abled and On Air. Thank you for joining us on Abled and On Air. Uh, what is computer information systems? Okay, so uh, computer information systems are uh, large-scale systems to handle needs of uh, you know, organizations and to, uh, to help people and organizations uh, manage large amounts of information. Okay. Now, today we're talking about museum exhibits um, and special needs and inclusiveness, making them inclusive. Um, what are some of the ways um, that um, can make um, exhibits inclusive for people with disabilities? Okay, there are many factors that can go into it, and it depends what type of uh, disabilities. I mean, there are a lot of accessibilities, you know, a lot of these applications today are just, uh, you know, web applications. So everything you can do for a web, you know, large print, uh, screen readers, all, all sorts of uh, things like that. So that's What's pretty exactly a screen reader? A screen reader, okay, for people, is that, you know, you show a screen and then it could read that screen to the disabled person or the person in need that uh, wants to hear what's there and see because it's hard for him to read the small print or read the print. Mm -hmm. You want to start asking me some questions? Yeah, so let's, uh, yeah, I think also because I think we, you know, it helps us when we know what people who use our systems, what are their uh, requirements and uh, and their needs. So, where would you would you, you like to go? You know, in terms of um, also something really general. Uh, in terms of museums, um, well, obviously in in life globally, mm -hmm. uh, it sometimes is hard to make things really accessible. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's supposed to because it's a law in uh, different ways. So, but, but I'm saying, you know, without any barriers, you without know, any uh, barriers, where well, would you, well, what are the places you'd really like to uh, visit? Well, uh, for example, um, 
recently I visited the Echo Science Center, yeah. uh, and that uh, the Echo Science Center is in Vermont. So the, that museum, you touch everything, yeah. and it's inclusive. Uh, um, I would love to go to, for example, the um, Muhammad Ali Museum in Kentucky. Uh -huh. um, any museum that has videos or media attached to it, people will flock to because it, it it's more accessible to the touch. Yeah. So if you're just looking at a screen and doing nothing, then uh, it's not that accessible. But if it's more, if if you can have accessibility by touching an exhibit, mm -hmm. then you're good to go. Um, then, as they say, you get more bang for your you, you get more bang for your buck when you pay to get into a museum, so you're, you're, it's more inclusive for people um, who need it. Yeah. You know. Okay. Go ahead. So what do you enjoy most about visiting a museum? Um, well, um, the history behind, if it's a museum that has history behind it, like the Museum of Natural History, or, or a museum about a president. Um, mm -hmm. Most of those museums are inclusive, again, because they have, um, they call it textile. Uh, uh, tactile. Tactile, sorry. Tactile exhibits that where you can touch. And so if you're blind and visually impaired, it helps, <clears throat> and it also helps if um, a map of a museum is also um, accessible for for us or anybody. Some people don't have a, a challenge, but yet they have a challenge getting or going to a museum because um, the it's either they might not understand the language, if it, or it's just not accessible enough to get in also. Because okay. some of these buildings. Um, All right, that leads depend. into my next question. It's like, maybe you could talk about it in general, but from your personal experience, what is the biggest barriers uh, to well, a visitor? Well, if, to visit for example, um, my wife sometimes uses a chair. Yeah. So if a building has too many steps, and not a ramp, um, then it's hard to get in. But case in point, the grandfather clause. If a building is more than 100 years old, you have to get city and sometimes state permission to get, uh, 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 to get it more accessible. It shouldn't have to be because it's a law, but unfortunately, sometimes there's bureaucracy behind it. Mm -hmm. So the less bureaucracy we have getting into a building, then you can, you know, help people by making it more accessible that way. Um, so I'm going to ask you this question. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, what type of, okay, well, um, in terms of cost, w would it cost more to make an, ex uh, an exhibit accessible, or it, is it more of have to making it accessible on your end? Uh, it's, you know, depends what uh, we're talking about. If we're talking about uh, you know, the application itself that's being used. Computer application. Right. Yeah. You know, the screen and, and the application. So today there's a lot of, you know, accessible standards. And if you build according to the accessible standards, you know, you should be, uh, you know, it shouldn't be much of a, an extra course because you, you build it correctly. The screen readers work. Uh, you know, you put the alternate text on the pictures. So it's not a lot of extra work and the only extra work well, is putting the, icons in place or something yeah or putting a you know text <clears throat> if there's an icon 
you know, to read. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes you also have to do it right to build, you know, for, I guess this is also an accessibility issue in a sense is that, you know, different people speak different languages. So, you know, if it's not in your language, then it's not accessible to you. So you want to build it so that all the language related uh, material is in a separate file that could be easily, you know, translated for uh, uh, special. For, exa for example, uh, I can put this example there, Yad Vashem, yeah. uh, which I've been, we've been to it, um, uh, is a Holocaust, the Holocaust Museum, but you have media there, you have mm. um, uh, uh, symbol, symbols, such yeah. as the, the amount of shoes mm. that represent uh, people. Um, so the more engaging whatever part of history it may be, the more engaging it is, the, the more people will be engaged to go. Um, right. And then also in terms of cost factor. Um, right, well, okay, well, of course, I, well, that was my first part. You know, so the software is, you know, relatively, you know, inexpensive to make more accessible. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a manner, you know, using the right design principles, but uh, using, uh, but I have a caveat on that also. But the, probably the more, you know, thing that's very costly is probably, you know, physical changes to a building site, especially if it's a uh, historical building and you have to use special methods in order to, you know, uh, make it more accessible, you know. No, but in terms of, I was talking about so cost very factor. Close. In terms of people with disabilities, many people with, with challenges. Ah, you know, it's in terms, no, I think in general, you know, the, I don't think no museum in the world charges more because you're disabled than for, uh, you know, a regular visit. No, there are. Example, yeah. it's closed wow. now, but the 9-11 memorial yeah. charged $50 to get in. Now, why? No, but was that, you know, for an excess, you know, for a disabled person, but they charge $50 for everyone? Everybody. Uh, okay, that's what I'm saying. Not yeah. everybody has a disabled rate to get into a museum. Right, right. But I'm saying, okay, but you, what you're saying is that there's a, a special rate, you know, that, that some museums are, uh, you know, uh, very expensive, and that's a, a barrier to... Is there to, a reason for to, that, because they have to keep it up? Or? Yeah, yeah, there's, you know, sometimes there can be lots of expenses in running a museum, and not everything comes from, you know, subscribers and members. You know, they try to keep, you know, most museums try to keep you know, the entrance rate's low because they want more visitors. And then they try things like memberships and things like that. But that's, uh, okay, that's, you know, uh, you know, less of a technical issue and, you know, out of my field of expertise. Okay. Um, now, I know I'm jumping around here, but um, uh, in terms of careers, since you have your PhD, if someone was to go into computers, whether they're disabled or learning about people with disabilities and computers, what is some advice that you could give somebody who okay. wants to go into the career field? Yeah, of I mean, actually, because of computer, because of this technology, it has been an accessible field. I remember as a young scientist at IBM, there was a guy by the name of uh, Bob White, and he, he was blind, and he was just very inspirational in how that he, you know, was able to, you know, work, and he was considered one of the top uh, researchers in his field, and he was blind, and it's, you know, it's a matter of, you know, making sure you have the technology, and, you know, that makes the, the information accessible to you. He had special equipment, you know, uh, you know, a braille reader and a braille typewriter and things like that so that he could work. And he, he was, you know, considered one of the best. Okay, more questions. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, so I'll go more questions. So we were talking about museums. So what would you, you know, okay, so, all right, maybe I'll get to the heart of the question. It's like, you know, so I was talking about earlier about expenses. So it doesn't cost much to develop a, an application that's accessible. But here's the question, you know, certain disabilities are silent. 
or, or what? Are silent or, or not silent there. Or not there or, no, but I'm thinking more of that, you know, are not, you know, so you can do hearing and, you know, and read, readers and things like that. But I think some of the disabilities, you know, say autism, mm -hmm. uh, or special needs of autism, you know, that means that you can't use the same application that you designed for everyone. That's something, okay. It's you fine. have to do a, a special application. So say, you know, autistic children, you, you know, you'd want, you know, to design for them. I have a colleagues who, in the University of Torino, who work on this issue applications for them. So they did a, a farm that is quiet. They need, you know, some things that are very quiet. They need things that maybe aren't aimed so much for the autistic child, but it's aimed for the caretaker of that child to help him through it. It's quiet, no large noises, no flashing lights, things well, like that. flashing lights also for epilepsy. Yeah. Because well, now, screens, example, um, the, the less pixels or, or, or the, the more technologically advanced a screen is and the less flashing you attribute from it, um, the more the exhibit can be accessible. Because, example, a 3D movie, a person with autism might not be able to go in a 3D movie or a person with epilepsy because of flashing stuff. You know, uh, an amusement park ride, uh, uh, a movie, um, but also a person with autism has certain attributes that uh, can have certain attributes um, uh, they, uh, you need something to calm them down more. And if you have an exhibit that is a calming example, plenty of libraries and exhibits have walking bridges with music. When you walk, mm. the crystals would sing or shake or yeah. something along those lines. And it's a calming effect. So uh, uh, maybe an exhibit can have an exhibit can have running water, a waterfall of some sort to calm them down so they'll be able to go to the exhibit. Okay. So right, I'll ask another question. What do you think about the idea of remote visiting? Uh, the idea is that someone goes to a, a museum while the challenged person remains at home and sees things through cameras that are attached to... Uh, um, well, during the pandemic, yeah. I had to do a school project. And that school project was visiting the Henry Ford Museum, and because uh, no one can go there. Mm -hmm. um, and they had a lecture um, on the Etzel and the cars and different mm -hmm. things. So I sat through a lecture, but they showed pictures. It was engaging. You got to ask questions. Uh, you got to, um, if you pushed a button on your computer, you could hear the roar of the engine, those things. Right. So the more engaging it can be. Um, although it's best when a person oh, okay. with... You, 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 all right, you're coming to my next question. Also, it's yeah. best for a person with a challenge to go out to the museum and not be a shut-in. There are certain cases where people have to be shut-ins, but it's not recommended. It's, it, because the more engaging you are to go out to the community, the better off it is for the person and the group. Okay, so that brings me to the... Uh, that wasn't too... No, that's fine. That, that, that was good. That was my, you know, and then you followed into what, what that question was, you know, is Taking it really is experience. It, yeah. 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 And so, you know, I guess in general, you know, people want to be at the place and see the original, the authentic things and not just see things from Example, remote. if I'm looking at, and, and, it's, and it's lots of colors, yeah. and if I'm looking up close at Frida Kahlo's paintings, I don't want to see that at home. I want to see that in an art gallery. Okay. You know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so this leads me to a, a problem, though, that sometimes these museums are in a historical building, 
And uh, you can't, you know, really, you know, change, uh, well, grandfather, sometimes you could be, grandfather. yeah, grandfather close. But the, no, that's just exempt you, but it really there are real problems with it. There was an interesting thing, you know, in, uh, in the Tower of David recently, they built, you know, an external elevator, so they didn't have to touch the building. And uh, you, go, you went into an elevator that was external to the building, a modern piece, and that took you up, you know, up without the elevator. You, yeah, up up the floors, and then there was a plank in to, in, 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 to walk inside. So they didn't have to, you know, change anything within the historical structure. They just did uh, additional structures. And there was another museum that's also similar that they uh, built on. Uh, an extra, uh, you know, modern piece, architectural piece on the old thing. So it looks interesting, you know, a little bit out of place because you have this something very modern with it. But what do you think about this dilemma that, uh, well, you know... Well, it's, uh, it's a big dilemma because there's something in America and also across the world, again, grandfather clause right. in, a, in a contract for a building means... If a building is, I'll give you a prime example. There's an art gallery two blocks from here, mm. okay? It took the art gallery years, 12, 13 years. The board had to approve it, the state had to approve it, so on and so forth. Mm. To get an elevator that's accessible for people with disabilities, 12 years in the making? That shouldn't be. Either lack of funding or lack of know-how or um, I don't want to say ignorant of people or ignorance, but the more people know about our, our challenges being challenged, um, example, I can walk up steps but using a banister. I can't walk um, the Philadelphia Art Museum where the Rocky statue is. I can't do that by myself. I need to use a banister to do that um, um, unless somebody else is with me. So some these are challenges that people okay. do. But if a building is, can get past the grandfather clause and put a ramp, then it's a good thing. Uh, okay, so but uh, I'm curious. So, do you, you really think, you know, for the way you're, you're, you're enthusiastic, you, you, you think everything uh, problem can be solved by technology or money, or are some problems just too money, big and not unsolvable? Mo no, it's not unsolvable. Okay. It, 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 it's called grassroots advocacy. Example: during the Obama, I know. A different topic, but during the Obama administration, it took one family who had a child named Rosa. Rosa's Law was created, so they went from office to office to office, knocking on doors with that little girl's help to get the word retarded taken out of medical jargon. So if grassroots advocacy still exists, to get buildings accessible, by all means, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll hold picket signs if we have to, to get something accessible. Grassroots advocacy needs to still be there, even though we have all this technology in the world. If you don't open your mouth, you don't get anything done. Okay. So, all right. That's interesting. So... All right, maybe we'll go on, a, you know, another negative, and then we'll go to more things positive. Right. What are your some of the biggest frustrations? So you mentioned money. before, you know, m money, you know, the, the the costs of getting into the meal, and you mentioned also physical accessibility, you know, physical yeah, the, barriers. Um, but it, with more education, 
Right now, I'm not talking now about the solutions, but let's mm -hmm. talk a little bit about what, what do you see are the problems that need to be addressed, you know, that was, and especially maybe things that could be addressed, not only physical, but to say, you know, things with applications and things like that. It, you know, if, so if what sort more of things that we as technologists? Exactly. Uh, talking about technology. If more people were to be uh, educated on, on computer applications, because the example, um, Apple was started in somebody's back, uh, uh, somebody's garage, right. if I'm not mistaken. So, one little idea, because uh, you, you've done patents, yeah. one little idea can can lead to the to something big. Uh, uh, um, Thomas Edison failed at so many things. But look at what he's done. There's a saying, fail to plan, fa plan to mm -hmm. fail. The more you discuss something in a think tank, and this goes back to technology, boardrooms, think tanks, the more you discuss something, the more things can get done. And if it's not done, if nobody knows about it, then you can't get it done. Mm -hmm. Did I go yeah, on? No, okay. No, but that's, uh, we're looking, you know, sort of things of, uh, you know, from a technology point of view. Uh, you know, what sort of? Maybe, oh, what is on your end? What is the future? What do you think the future of computer technology will be? Uh, because it, it extends. Computer automation goes back to. Owning Hardout's uh, 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 example of um, pushing a button and a sandwich comes out of yeah. a machine. That was right. the beginning of things. Right. And even probably be before then. Right. So I think, you know, computers, you know, there are two ways that, you know, computers are getting, uh, I guess the term smarter, or able to handle more complex t uh, tasks. You know, you have things like, you know, chat GBT and AI. And what is AI again? AI is artificial intelligence. So and, a robot. Yeah, well, it's not so much a robot. A robot is more physical. Maybe that's the, uh, th uh, the other half. But it's sort of like programs that the neural networks that learn and learn from large amounts of information and can answer questions without it being programmed exactly in advance. In other words, in an essence, you, you, the computer thinks, but, it, I, I but the, if, Okay, so this brings me to this kind of question. If the computer thinks, example, yeah. I'm gonna say this, yeah. freedom of speech, okay? During power, out, power outages yeah. and things, because Vermont, we, we ex experience, if something's too overloaded, like the, yeah. um, uh, then either it's gonna shut down or not work properly. So, a computer is only as good with the technology it has. Example, yeah. so how, how, how many times does a computer program, on your end, how many times does a computer program have to be updated? In order to work properly, it depends. Properly. It depends. You know, and at the early stages, you update a lot because you you do pilots. You learn things about things, and you. What's a pilot? A pilot is a experiment. You know, a small experiment. You run the program. You know, say it's a museum application. So you don't offer it up to the whole general public, but you take, you know, two or three people and let them use the application, get feedback and things like that. I think an important thing here is. You know, as part of the people that you do a pilot with is to do it with at least one or two special needs persons so you see how they react to the application because it might not be the same. So that's uh, important. And uh, so I was saying, yeah, okay. So I was saying, so that's, you know, one thing is the application. The other thing in the future of computers will be, uh, you know, what I call, you know, tangible computing or, you know, invisible computing. You know, you know won't, we won't have a, a device, but it'll be built in everywhere. You know, uh, example, you Apple, next year, I was going to bring yeah. this. I know it's proprietary, but Apple, next year, will have goggles 
Right. So for television. Future, right. So in the future, we may not even need goggles. It'll be built into the glasses or might even... Well, they have the OrCam now. Right. Well, you're right. So things like OrCam, but the uh, OrCam is sort of, you know, telling you with the video, it's not, you know, projecting a screen. So here it would be maybe project a screen onto reality, augmented no, reality. Or, OrCam is a different... Yeah. OrCam... You, you can read, have a right. book and you read right. and it reads back and to reads you, it right. like in a That's screen right. reader type right. of But you might have other applications in the future of computing where you know, it could read back to you, it could, you, know, you could be looking at uh, an oven and it would say, okay, that, you're looking at an oven. You know, it would tell you or, what you could or, recognize. Or you could push a button, oh, but, but it recognize. won't go oven turn on. I don't think... It, no, but know. it might be that you could then do and say, uh, turn on oven, like, you know, today you have Alexa, you have verbal commands, so that would help people... Can you that, turn on an oven with Alexa? Uh, yeah, because they have power, they have power switches that, uh, oh. that uh, turn on the power on and off. So, yeah. And eventually uh, you might have devices. You, we're talking now the future. The future is unbelievable what could happen in the future, what may... Well, may yeah, happen. the more accessible, example, our apartment, they're going to be installing an ADA switch for a person that is low, you know, right. uh, uh, you roll up to the wheelchair, you push the button, the oven turns on. Yeah. Or, right. you, or something like that. Yeah. You know. Okay. But getting back, this brings me back to a question because we're talking about the future. And the question is, is it always all... Uh, always all technology. I think uh, we, you know, or is it important, you know, sometimes, you know, special needs people have uh, things that they, you know, need and all of a sudden you need help from a human. There's always, you know. It, the self bringing to this. Yeah. Okay. Um, that, it, it, no, we're not, it's not a museum, but it, it can be part of it. Self-checkouts in supermarkets, example. If the computer goes down, okay, you still need someone to help either put money into the machine or help, help you, example, I'm visually impaired. There's a button on a lot of those self-checkouts. You can make it larger so you can see it. Yeah. Um, but there's always someone that has to be there. You can't get rid of humans completely. Uh, you can't get rid of the human race. People need jobs. <laughs> so, oh, well, okay. uh, unless somebody's going to sit at the computer for the exhibit. Um, for example, a directing booth has lots of buttons and things. Yeah. Uh, but you still, you still have to operate the computer from somewhere. You can't Okay, I know that COVID shut down a lot, mm. and people are working from home. But you can't just push a button from your house. Okay, pay me for eight hours. Uh, you got to do something else other than just pushing buttons. You have to be there to interact with people, so on and so forth. This is why, get into a small other topic, Older people, when they retire, they volunteer in hospitals mm. to interact with people. There's always going to be interaction. You can't stop that. Even if you have, right. even if you, you think, have the best robots right, in the right. world. But do you think is it even more so for special needs than say for a regular person? You need more interaction. Special education schools were in peril during the pandemic, because, example, kindergarten children need interaction. First mm -hmm. grade kids, you can't sit them at a computer. Okay, you can watch a cartoon like Peppa Pig or uh, for half an hour, but you also have to interact them. Um, uh, they're gonna get bored after a while. So, the more interaction you have, the better. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so this has been very interesting. Okay, one more question because we're almost towards the end. That's fine. But uh, what sort of things are you interested? Would you want to see, you know, 
I guess it's true for everybody, but the, okay, you know, what would you want to see from a special needs application when you go to a museum? What what you, you want um, to see? Historical stuff. Historical to, stuff. More keypads. Yeah. Means more interaction. You push on a button. Right. But and maybe we will be able to talk, you know, big. But I'm, I'm now I'm not talking about how to do it. But now, what sort of things would you want? Would you want, you know, to hear more about? exhibits, uh, does special needs interest you as a museum visitor? Like if there's a special needs angle to a certain picture, would you want to hear about that? Exactly. that, that? Yeah, exactly. Uh, the Roosevelt Museum right. in New York yeah. is about our president who, uh, who had polio and right. he, he did a lot of things despite his challenge. So that's an interesting angle of things and how America um, was able to come out from the war and so on and so forth, and he didn't let his challenge get to him. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, maybe the Helen Keller Museum or, or Lewis Braille. No, but I'm saying, okay, so yeah, so there are certain museums that are connected. What I'm saying is that all of a sudden, you know, in the middle of some museum, that the painter, when he did this painting, uh, you know, it was done by holding. He was disabled, so he did it with you know with his feet, or you know, or the, piano, you know, the, the movie, the piano. Right. Yeah. But the, all sorts of you know, you have all sorts of interesting facts that you know, okay, so the really special needs. So that would be of more of interest to you. But the question is, okay, uh, I'll let you. Okay. No, wrap no, up. go ahead. No, 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 we can go over it quickly. All right. Go ahead. But uh, yeah, so what sort of things uh, interest you in museums. So you talked about history, you talk, we, we talked about now, you know, if there was special needs involved in making the picture or, you know. So uh, the, more, the more subject matter about people with special needs would interest me. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, but the more interactive you have a museum exhibit. And you like to interact, if you like to work with it, so, you know, to interact with the exhibit and things like that. So yeah. things that do, uh, you would be able to ask questions about a painting and would answer you, mm -hmm. that would be sort of stuff that would be interesting. You know? Okay. Well, we'd like to thank you okay. for joining me on this edition of Able Den On Air. Uh, for more Pleasure being here. Thank you. Uh, for more information on Able Den On Air or anything else you've seen today, you can contact our website at www.orcamedia.net. That's O-R-C-A-M-E-D-I-A dot net. I'm Lauren Seiler. Unfortunately, Arlene is not here. Uh, we wish her a speedy recovery. See you next time on the next exciting edition. And thank you, Dr. Wacker, for joining us all the way from Israel. See you next time on the next exciting edition of Able to Not Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time. Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Able to Run Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able Den On Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations.
the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.